Every week when I drive to work, every day, uh, I drive by on my left, heading west on Northwest Highway, Sparkman Hillcrest Cemetery. And not every Sunday, or not every week, I promise I come to the office more than just once a week. But every time I drive by that place, at least I wish every time I drove by it, I think about the fact that somebody is saying goodbye for the last time. I remember that somebody is maybe having the worst day of their life there, and that somebody's being laid to rest there multiple times, multiple people are being put in that place that day. There's lots of funerals that take place. Mickey Mantle is buried at Sparkman Hillcrest. I did my first uh, graveside service at Sparkman Hillcrest. And I'm reminded of the fact that one day, all of us will wind up in a place like that. Whether it's a cemetery, columbarium, whatever it may be. Unfortunately, death is something that awaits every single one of us. And we've been walking through a sermon series on the I Am statements of Jesus, and I don't know, I don't want to rank them, but his saying today, I am the resurrection and the life, is maybe for me the one that gives me the most hope and the most joy. But every single one of us will experience the grief that comes along with death. In fact, many of us have already experienced it. It's very rare to have lived any length of time and to not have grief. In fact, we are brought into this world grieving, angry that we've been taken out of our mother's body. Children grieve over the loss of a stuffed animal. High schoolers grieve over the loss of a high school sweetheart, a breakup, right? You grieve over the job opportunities you didn't get. You grieve when your sports team loses. You grieve when your spouse passes away, when you lose a child, when you bury your parents. Grief is a part, unfortunately, of life because death is a part of life. And so today we're going to talk about how in the midst of grief, where is God? And what it is that grief actually does to our faith, how it changes it, how it affects it, and how Jesus comes to comfort us in the midst of it. So today we're going to be in John chapter 11. It's a famous story about Jesus' resurrection of Lazarus. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to read the whole thing. John writes in very big sections. And so it's going to be hard to look at all of it, but we're going to look at parts. And today I want us to see that grief confronts our faith, it clarifies our faith, and then Jesus comes and comforts our grief. So let's start by talking about how grief comforts our, or confronts our faith. It confronts our faith in verse 17 of chapter 11. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. And so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. This is the last chapter before the story of John, the story of Jesus in John, pivots to the journey to Jerusalem and the cross. So we're about halfway through the gospel. And if you're familiar with scripture, Jesus acts kind of odd to me in this story. This is following his teachings that we talked about in the past couple weeks about uh, uh, Jesus being the good shepherd. And he's called out the religious leaders for being bad shepherds. And because of the response that he's received to that, it was not good. He retreated across the Jordan River. And he went to the place where John used to baptize people. And it seems like, according to John, that that's where he stays until he makes his final journey to Jerusalem. And it's while he's there that he gets word that Lazarus, his friend, is dying. Now, Lazarus and Mary and Martha, they're not just anybody's. 
They're not people that, that show up every once in a while. Like they are close friends, close, close friends. These are probably the kind of people that Jesus felt like he could be himself around. It wasn't this burden of being the Messiah and being the son of God. He could, he could be just Jesus. And so these are important people to him. And they know that if Jesus comes, he can heal Lazarus. They believe. They're people full of faith. In fact, they know, they probably heard about in Luke chapter 7, how Jesus healed a man from across town. The Roman centurion servant, right? Jesus didn't even have to go to him. And so we don't, they probably didn't know what the range was on his power, but they knew he could heal if he could just get close. And Jesus does the most remarkable thing. He does nothing. Keeps doing what he's doing. He waits two more days and then he goes to Bethany. And while he's on his way, when he gets close, Martha, who is not one to sit back while there's work to be done, confronts him. And she says, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She doesn't hide. She doesn't pretend that she's not grieving. She doesn't act like everything's okay. She's honest. Now, there's two things we need to see about her comment. One is it's not a rebuke. This is not a rebuke. She's not coming down on Jesus saying, you messed up by taking so long. That's not what she's saying. What she's saying is it's a statement of lament. It's the same thing we say. Oh, if they had just left five minutes later or five minutes sooner, they would have avoided that accident. Oh, if we would have just caught it sooner. There's treatments that could have been done, but now there's nothing. We make the same comments, knowing that if things had been different, we could have changed maybe the, the present that we live in. But secondly, it's a statement of faith. It's a statement of trust. It's a statement of lament, but it's also a statement of trust. She believes that Jesus can do the things she believes her faith is not shaken. She knows that Jesus is who he claims to be. She believes. Her comment in verse 22 shows us, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. She does not doubt the power of Jesus. Her faith, though, is changing. We're watching as Jesus, through her grief, is going to spin a cocoon around the faith of Martha. And out of it is going to emerge a butterfly that is more mature, more beautiful, more resplendent than she could have ever imagined. But unfortunately, a butterfly is not always what emerges when grief confronts our faith. When I was getting ready for this sermon, I, I had to think about the fact that my own personal encounters with grief are not that many. And that I'd be speaking in front of a group of people, many of you are older than me, and you've probably encountered grief in a lot more circumstances than I have. Some of you are younger than me and have encountered more intense grief than I have. So I wanted you to know what I did was I read a lot of people who have encountered grief. One of them was C.S. Lewis. He wrote a great book called A Grief Observed. He wrote it when his wife died of cancer. And it's a great book. It's really short. I read it in a day. It is, it is a brief read. It's basically journal entries that he wrote. And he has this to say about his faith and his encounter with grief. He says, not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion to dread is not, so there's no God after all. But so this is what God is really like. Deceive yourself no longer. You cannot leave an encounter with grief and not have your faith altered. It will transform it. It will shape it. If you've grieved once and then you grieve again, it will reshape it. Lewis says that this is God knocking down the house of cards that you thought was your faith. Grief confronts our faith. It forces us to ask real questions about what we believe about God, what we believe about Jesus, what we believe about what we actually think. Do we really believe the doctrines that we say we believe or do we not? 
It's easy when someone else is struggling with grief to offer up the pithy statements that we give, right? Oh, they're in a better place. They're in a better place. They're, oh man, you know, I, I, I just know they're, they're happier now, right? Or even if it's not the death of a loved one, it, it could be, be even just a missed opportunity, right? Somebody, some people say, you know, when, when God closes the door, he opens a window. You ever try to climb through a window? Sometimes I feel like God opens the second story windows for me. I've got to do a little bit more work. God has a plan. But when you go through that season of grief, those words don't seem quite as comforting as you think they do when they come out of your mouth to someone else. Sometimes our faith does emerge as this beautiful butterfly. Other times what comes out, or what seems to come out, is this cold reflection of yourself, your past self, that mocks you. How could you have so naively believed in a God that would provide comfort now that you were in pain? He seemed so distant. How foolish you were to have believed such childish things And usually what happens, I think, is that you vacillate between the two. Some days is really good. Your faith seems like that butterfly, right? And then other days when you miss that person so, so much, you wonder, where are you, God, in the midst of my grief? You need to know something. God is with you. It may not seem like it. It may not feel like it. But this is why Christ put on flesh. It's why he dwelt among us. It's why he is Emmanuel. We say Emmanuel a lot at Christmas. Maybe we should say it more at funerals. Because he is with us. We say things when people die. Oh, they've gone to be with Christ. Sure, that's true. You were with him in present. But the Spirit of God is with us now. Jesus wants to comfort you. He grieves with you. In a portion of the passage that unfortunately we're not going to get to today, it says Jesus wept. Why did he weep? I think he wept because he was so angry at what death had done. In some ways, this passage doesn't help us. In some ways, this is not a very comforting passage. And I think one of the reasons why is in verse 23, it says, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Jesus does the very thing we said just not to do. That's such a trite statement. Again, I don't know if he put his hand on her shoulder, said it with a comforting tone. Probably anything out of the mouth of Jesus is incredibly comforting. But off the page like this, it sounds just like a theological comfort it's like if, if, if a pastor came to you and was like, well, you know, they're in heaven now, so it's okay. You don't have to cry. It sounds so disconnected. We'll talk about why Jesus does this in a minute. But I should have said this earlier. The reason why this passage is not a great passage to go to when you're grieving is because this passage isn't about grief. It's not. This passage is about Jesus' conquest over the grave. We're about halfway through the Gospel of John, and John is dropping a little hint. He's saying, guess what? Jesus is about to conquer the grave forever. This little instance of grave conquest here, this is just a beachhead for the conquest that's about to take place in full effect. Because Lazarus would die again. This isn't Lazarus being raised, by the way, he gets raised. This isn't him being raised to his glorified eternal state. His sisters will bury him again. This passage isn't about grief. It's about Jesus' conquest of death. But let me say this. If all that Jesus has conquered is death, but he doesn't conquer the grief that goes with it, that travels in the wake of death, I don't know that I feel much comfort Revelation, the very end, says that Jesus will wipe away every tear. I don't know what this will look like. I don't know if the eternal glorified state that we'll be in will be one that doesn't remember our griefs and so we have no tears. I tend to think that's not likely. I tend to think we will remember. 
Because I think it's important, just as we had the bread and the cup today, to remember. I think remembering is such a central component of Scripture. I think we will remember the grief. I think we will remember the pain. And I think we will also get to see how God redeems it and changes us and transforms us. And I think the comfort and the glory of God will be so overwhelming that our grief will pale in comparison. Jesus came to give us life today and life after death. And it's easy for me to sit here and say all this, having myself not walked through a great deal of grief. I've never buried uh, a spouse, praise God. I've never buried my children. Both my parents, praise God, are still alive. So I read a lot this week, like I said. One of the guys I read, his name is Kelly Capich. If you struggle with uh, chronic pain, physical pain, Kelly Capich's book called Embodied Hope is a fantastic read. He kind of gets into some theological, doctrinal stuff, and then he kind of walks through how to process physical pain spiritually. But he also talks about grief quite a bit, and he says this. He says, to have healthy fellowship with God, we must be honest and realistic about our circumstances and our reactions to them. One of the ways that Jesus conquers our grief is that he forces us to be honest about it, that we are sad. And it forces us also to be honest about our relationship with him. So grief confronts our faith. It challenges us to look at the reality that we're dealing with, but it also clarifies our faith. Grief clarifies our faith. Look again at 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Jesus says to Martha a promise, something that she only can take on faith. And what I think is neat about Martha is her teachings kick in. She's probably raised from a very small age. What to the right response here? She believes in the resurrection. She's a good church member. And so when Jesus says, your brother's going to rise again, she says what she's been taught to say. Yes, I know that on the last day, Lazarus is going to be alive again. It doesn't change the fact that it hurts now. So I think Martha's being honest. At the same time, I think Martha genuinely believes what she's saying. She doesn't seem to be the kind of woman who would speak in such a way that would not genuinely present her thoughts. She seems a very uh, outspoken woman in in a very good way. And Jesus takes this statement and he entrusts Martha with a brand new truth. She receives, apparently privately, one of the seven I am statements of Jesus. Nobody else is there. And what Jesus is doing here, when he says, I am the resurrection and the life, he's taking her theological belief. She believes in the resurrection. He takes her theological, abstract, general doctrinal belief... And he puts it on a concrete person himself. I am the resurrection and I am the life. This is brilliant. You know why he does this? Because up until her brother died, her grief was abstract. She knew about grief. She, She thought about grief. Maybe she even walked through it before, but this was different. Her grief was the face of her brother. Her grief was the burial shroud wrapped around her brother's face. It was the face of her brother that she kissed for the last time before she put him in the tomb. And so a a general abstract theological truth isn't going to help somebody whose concrete grief is so real. And so Jesus came to her and says, no, 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 no. Don't think about theology. Don't think about abstract stuff right now. Think about the concrete person of me, of Christ You don't need resurrection in life. You need I am. You need me. And I am the resurrection and the life. This really comes in two parts, resurrection and life. He describes them both. The first is in 25. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. He's affirming what Martha believes. He's like, yes, you're right. Those who believe will be resurrected to a new life in me. But he goes on. 
In verse 26, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, is he saying that those who believe enough in Jesus are never going to die? We know that's not true. Nobody's said that. Nobody believes that. Scripture doesn't bear that out. Experience doesn't bear that out. What he's offering here is the Zoe life. Those who trust in me, who hold fast to me, will experience eternal life today. Do you believe that I am the central focus of everything that you need? What this is saying is he's undermining everything that death does. We think death is a period, a finality, an end statement, close the book. We talk about things like the last chapter of a person's life. And Jesus says, rip that chapter out. It's not a period, it's a comma. At worst, it's a semicolon. Because you will go on in me. You will be raised to walk again in me. And he says, do you believe this, Martha? She agrees. I don't know why we don't treat Martha's confession of faith here with the same reverence that we do Peter's. I mean, I think I have an idea of why. Peter gets called Satan after his confession of faith. Martha doesn't. I feel like Martha should get a little bit more respect for her confession of faith than we do. Because notice what she says. She says, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. That is an accurate understanding of who Jesus Christ is. She has faith still in her Messiah, despite having every single reason to doubt. And that's when Jesus changes everything for her. It's critical for us to see it. Jesus does not, the greatest gift that Jesus gives her is not her brother back that day. The greatest gift she gets is to be taken by the hand personally of her Lord and shown a deeper, realer truth than she ever thought possible. She gets invited to see behind the curtain her faith is clarified. It's refined. And it's not refined and clarified for Jesus. Jesus knows the quality of her faith. He knows all things. It's clarified for her. Lewis, again, in A Grief Observed, says, God has not been trying an experiment on my faith or love in order to find out their quality. He knew it already. It was I who didn't. He always knew that my temple was a house of cards. His only way of making me realize the fact was to knock it down. And I know this all sounds harsh, but there's a reason why I wanted to read someone who was going through grief. Lewis found this comforting. I had something like this happen to me. I know I said I hadn't walked through a season of grief, not a real one, but one that I thought was real at the time. I've told you about my struggles with anxiety before. In 2015, it was really, really bad. And I was convinced because of some numbness and twitching in my legs and leg pain that I was having and apparent weakness in my legs that I was having, I became convinced that I had ALS. I thought I was dying. Doctors, therapists, people for three months couldn't tell me any different. I was convinced. And I began to lament everything that I thought I was gonna lose. I went back and read my journal entries from this past, from that experience, from that time. They're full of fear, they're full of anxiety, they're full of worry, and above all, they're full of grief because I was convinced that at 32, I would die. And I would never have kids and never get to exceed the things that I wanted to see, do the things that I wanted to do, become the person that I wanted to become. You see, my definition of the resurrection and the life was very different than Jesus' definition of resurrection and life. I thought it was all those things. And Jesus, through this bout with anxiety, I got a greater gift than my anxiety being taken away. And I know it's not taken away because I still deal with it. But I got a greater gift. I was shown that my faith was shallow. I loved Jesus for what he gave me. I loved Jesus for the way I felt like he rubber stamped my life. Part of me probably also loved Jesus because I was paid to love Jesus. That was my job of a pastor. I didn't think Jesus was the resurrection and the life. And having my legs twitching 24-7, numbness in my body, weakness, pointed me to the fact that my view of Jesus was very small and my understanding of what life is was very small. I was afraid to die. And this clarified my faith for me. 
It opened my eyes to see the house of cards that my faith really was, the idols that I set up. D.A. Carson, a commentator, had this to say about Martha's confession. Her response, he says, is neither mere repetition nor the pious but distracted and meandering response of someone who has not followed the argument. Her reply carries the argument forward, for she holds that the one who is the resurrection and the life must be such by the virtue of the fact that he is God's promised Messiah. You see, my response to my grief and suffering could not carry the argument forward. My response could not allow Jesus to do the work that he wanted to do in my life. I was stuck. And so Jesus had to knock the house of cards over so that he could show me that he had something greater for me. The resurrection and the life, the Zoe life. And I wouldn't change a thing about it other than maybe my response. Part of me is ashamed of it. So how do we make sure that Jesus gets his opportunity to work through our grief? How do we make sure that grief clarifies our faith? One is don't live in denial. We said this before, but it bears repeating. Be honest when you grieve. Secondly, don't romanticize the grief. Grief is not pretty. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to put on the nice look and and act a certain way. You don't have to keep the stiff upper lip. I think it's one of the reasons why my generation finds ourselves struggling to process grief. It's because so many generations before us, and this isn't your fault, I'm not accusing anybody of anything, just making a comment. So many generations before were taught, yeah, just stiff upper lip, keep going. We got work to do. We don't know how to process grief. And then lastly, recognize that death is gonna happen to every single one of us. That's why I mentioned the memento mori earlier. The memento mori is is this thing that reminds you you're a human being, you're going to die. We don't like to be reminded of that in this day and age. We put our sick in hospitals, we put our elderly in homes, we put our dying in hospice, we put our dead in a cemetery that we don't have to go to unless we have a reason to. Back in the day, the cemetery was right next to the church. So every week you came to worship, you'd walk up the steps of the church and you'd look over there and you'd say, yep, mom's there, dad's there, grandpa's there, grandma's there, uncle's there. The three kids that died in childbirth are there and one day I'll be there too. And now we hide. We don't think about it. We don't talk about it. We don't even go to funerals much anymore. I was reading Funeral Director uh, Daily, which I do not read often, by the way. But I saw it for this statistic. The average number of people attending a funeral in 1999 was 43. It's down in 2018 to 36. It's a 20% drop. Don't hide from death. It will not hide from you. Don't be surprised. It's the end for all of us unless the Lord returns. So Travis, what role does Jesus play in comforting me? I'm hurting. What role does Jesus play? Well, he comforts our grief. He does. Look at verse 38. Verse 38. Then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he's been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. There are three things that Jesus does in this passage that show us how to access the comfort. Remember, he is grieving too. He is sad too. There's three things he does that shows us a way to grieve and to access the comfort that God offers us. The first, this is going to sound trite, But the first one is to praise him and to be grateful. To praise him and to be grateful. Despite losing someone or something, we still have the opportunity. We still have breath and we still have life. We have the opportunity. We have things to worship God for. It may not seem like a great gift when you're struggling to put one foot in front of the other because of your loss. 
but it is. In Kelly Capich's work, he, he provides a, uh, a matrix of sort to talk about grief and, and how you should process it. And he said, the two essential parts of, of processing grief are both lament and hope. And he said, if you don't have both of those, you're going to fall into a, a, a ditch. And so if you have lament without hope, you fall into that tailspin of grief that you just can't get out of, right? If you have hope without lament, you wind up being that optimistical person that everybody's like, why are they smiling? They, they just lost a close one. You, you, you just kind of seem naive, right? If you have neither lament nor hope, then you're just a shell. There's nothing going on. It's just numb, right? But if you have lament and hope together, you have this opportunity of a platform upon which to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm in so much pain, but even now I believe. Help me. So we have the opportunity to be thankful, to praise him. Secondly, we're given an opportunity to proclaim. Notice what he says here in the passage. He says, Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said that on account of the people standing around. Jesus prays out loud so that everybody else has the opportunity to join in the celebration of what his father's done, what his father's about to do through him. Lewis again talks about the role of praise and public praise in grief. And what grief does to us, it tends to turn ourselves inward, right? So while we mourn the loss of the person, we begin to mourn instead our loss of the person. Oh, things are never going to be the same again. I'm not going to get to enjoy these things again. I'm not going to go to this place. Lewis talks about how at first he avoided the places that his wife and he liked to go because it brought out so much pain. And then he's like, I stopped doing that because I was just hurting all the time anyway. I might as well go to the places I enjoy. Look at the things that I've lost. Look at the things I've given up. We, we begin to develop a little bit of self-pity, and, and, and that's natural in grief. But Lewis says this, he says we have this tendency to turn grief towards ourself, then to the person that's gone, and then to God. And he says this is the opposite of how it should be. He says praise is the mode of love which always has some element in jo of joy in it. Praise, though, in due order. Of him, God is the giver of her, he's speaking of his wife, as the gift. Don't we in praise somehow enjoy what we praise, however far we are from it? Praise is essential. Because when we praise God as the giver of the gift that we gained, we're able to rightly appreciate the thing that we lost. How many of you have been to a funeral or been to a, a, a service and people talked about the person, they're like, well, they were just such a sweetheart. They were so nice. And you know for a fact that the person was like the most cantankerous human being to ever walk the face of the earth. Because we romanticize people after that. There's the old saying, right? Don't speak ill of the dead. Can we speak honestly of the dead? Is that okay? Praise of God as the giver of the gift because we are in his light allows us to remember the person we lost more accurately more vividly. God's tendency, grief's tendency is to turn ourselves inward. And there's some of that that's okay. Like you should be cared for. You should be taken care of. But it gives us an opportunity to praise. The last gift is the best of all. Verse 43, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. You know why Jesus says, Lazarus, come out? I read this this week, and I was doing our dwell readings, which is really cool. If you've, if you've been in dwell with us this week, you've read through the entire chapter. So I would encourage you to go back and look at chapter 11 and continue to do the dwell readings with us. But the reason why he says Lazarus, this moved me to tears this week, is because if he had not said Lazarus' name, every single person in those tombs would have walked out. Jesus had to be specific because it wasn't their time yet. I was watching uh, the movie uh, Avengers Endgame, right? Some of you may be familiar with that movie. If you're not, I'm going to ruin it for you right quick. 
In the movie, the Avengers have lost half of the universe has been destroyed, and they have to go back in time to get some rocks to bring people back to life. And it's this whole two hour, a two and a half hour epic. It's really enjoyable. It's good popcorn watching. And they are Earth's mightiest heroes. That's what the Avengers are called. They're Earth's mightiest heroes. And they go through all of this work spanning. They time travel. They do all this stuff to get the people back. And they do it. And Jesus brings a person back in a word. He doesn't have to go back in time. He doesn't have to chase down rocks. He doesn't have to do a magic spell. He just speaks. Earth's mightiest hero indeed. You know why he speaks? He speaks Lazarus back into existence because he spoke him into existence in the first place. He spoke everything into existence in the beginning. This isn't hard for Jesus. And the greatest gift that we get is that Jesus gives us a glimpse into the fact that he has conquered death. And that one day, if we have faith and trust in him, one day, if we believe, if we put our faith in him today, if we believe in him as the resurrection and the life, rather than our own ideas, rather than our own good works, rather than our own purposes, if we trust in him, one day he'll call out to us, come out. It's time to come out. It's time to be alive again. And many of us today are in tombs of our own making, not tombs of grief, tombs of sin, tombs of brokenness, tombs of death. And Jesus says, come out. Come out. You don't have to stay there. You don't have to live like that. I have life for you. Come out. He says to the things that bind us, the things that shackle us, the addictions that hold us back, unbind him and let him go. Unbind her and let her go. Just like he said about Lazarus. You know what be the most ridiculous thing in this story? Is if when Jesus said, Lazarus, come out, Lazarus said, no, nah, I'm good. I'm going to stay in here. We laugh. But today, the God of creation is calling you out of the tomb that you've lived in for far too long. And some of you will walk out of this room and say, no, nah, I'm good in the tomb. I'm going to stay here. Don't stay in the tomb. Come out. And yes, maybe you will meet grief. And yes, maybe there will be challenges. And yes, maybe you will lose things. But he will be there to comfort your grief. And your grief will clarify your faith when it confronts you. And you will be changed. Come out. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, by your grace you have delivered us from sin, death, and evil. And now you call to us to come out, to leave behind the burial shroud. I pray that we would. It's in your name we pray. Amen.